Great. Uh, thank you so much uh, for joining everyone uh, to the first of our four part series on content moderation. Um, I am your host and moderator for today, Nafia Chaudhry, and I will just kick off with intros for about five minutes. And then uh, we will have a, a moderated panel uh, session for 30 minutes and then open it up for Q&A, where all of you will have an opportunity to ask questions to our awesome speakers today. Um, so really quickly with intros, I'll just firstly start off with intro to this panel itself and the foundry uh, or Internet Law and Policy Foundry, um, with, which are organizing this event. So today's panel is organized by the Foundry and co-sponsored by uh, TikTok, Microsoft, and Swilgen. And the, uh, for those of you who are joining us for the first time today, uh, the Foundry is a collaborative organization for internet law and policy professionals who are passionate about disruptive innovation. The Foundry offers members a platform for professional development um, with speaker panels such as this, with different workshops, as well as hackathons, um, which we have coming up in October, uh, which is also focusing on content moderation and something to look forward to for all of you who are passionate about that space. Uh, we also have offered constructive debate uh, through our Slack channel, um, a network building through a lot of happy hours, which is currently at pause because of COVID, uh, but you should be looking forward to uh, as we are gonna re uh, resume them soon. Uh, and um, a cohort of skilled attorneys and policy analysts who are eager to help shape the development of this uh, of technology law and policy space. Um, Cool. So who is has been rambling for the last three minutes to all of you? I'm Nakia Chaudhry. I'm a fairly recent graduate from Stanford University, where I studied privacy, security policy, and focused on online safety, uh, with specific research on surveillance um, in authoritarian regimes. And since then, I've been committed to the trust and safety space, um, working um, in um, global operations at previously global operations at Facebook. Um, I'll just mute everyone sorry um yeah. okay um cool so we'll move to the intros to our speakers uh yeah i will be going on for a little longer so today we have our awesome speakers tara wadwa and erica barros um so tara is the policy director for tiktok us where she leads the development of policies and moderation strategies that aim to create a welcoming, supportive, and safe platform for 100 plus million, 100 million plus US community members. Previously, she focused on developing policies to protect against hateful behavior and harassment for TikTok globally. Before joining TikTok, Tara spent a decade as a researcher and administrator at NYU Stern Center for Business and Human Rights, where she focused on leveraging corporate commitment to enhance human rights protections in a variety of sectors, including technology. Tara holds a Master of Public Administration from the NYU Wagner School of Public Service and a BA from Yale University. We also have Erica with us. Erica Bars is a seasoned policy expert with over 10 years of experience as Vimeo's, uh, Vimeo's head of policy. She helps the company navigate the challenging landscape of international tech policy and regulation. Erica is also a trained lawyer and Harvard Law School graduate. So thank you so much to both of you for joining us today. Um, so today we are going to go over as this is an intro session, just going to the very basics. So as the, the first question that I have for both of you is you know, going to the fundamentals. Um, why is it that we moderate content? Like, Should we even as platforms uh, moderate uh, the content that we have on our platforms? Erica, do you want to go for, or Tara, go ahead, sorry. Yeah, sure. Uh, well, uh, it, it, it's a great question and a basic question, of course. Uh, content moderation is, is, is fundamental to us. We are obviously a, a, a platform that hosts user-generated user content. And in that uh, sense, one of the uh, core functions of our trust and safety team, uh, whose job is to, to enforce our acceptable use policy, is uh, to make sure that we can keep our platform and our community safe and uh, uh, prevent them from being exposed from content that may be illegal or legal but harmful harmful to our users. And this goal is, is, can, can be anything from CSAM and terrorist content to 
fraud, misinformation, hate speech, um, and all sorts of different types of abuse. So, uh, yeah, it's it, it's uh, it's it's fundamental for for that very reason. So I, I'd say it's 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 um, twofold. One, to be able to enforce our terms of service uh, uh, in the way that we want to to enforce them, to have the plat the type of platform that we want to have, and more fundamentally, simply to keep our our community is safe from this type of content. Yeah, it's, such a, it's so good to sort of take a step back and think, why are we actually doing the work we're doing and what purpose does it serve? And I, I agree completely with everything Erica said around keeping users safe, making sure that we're uh, maintaining a platform that we really strive to create for our community on the um, TikTok or other platforms as well. I think the um, addition I'd like to point out is it's also a way for us to cultivate and realize our mission. Um, for us at TikTok, we are a quirky, app that likes to um, inspire creativity and bring joy to everyone in our community. And to create that and to feel safe in expressing yourself authentically, it's imperative that you feel like you have an open space where you're free from harassment and bullying, uh, potential hate speech, or even content that you're not ready to encounter, like pornography or uh, violent extremism. So it's really important to us not only to ensure safety, which is first and foremost our goal, but also to make sure that our community is able to cultivate um, according to our mission and everyone's able, able to enjoy it uh, in the way that we strive to have them. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks for answering that question. And Erica, you mentioned, and you both kind of mentioned, touched up uh, a little bit on the terms of services and some of the community standards that you have in protecting the users. I'd love to understand a little bit around what are some of the key principles that the trust of, the terms of services are based on and some of these policies are, um, are based on. Yeah, sure. So I, I think this, this goes back to what, what Tara was saying, right? Like terms of service are obviously drafted in, in, in a way that helps the company achieve its mission and its objective. Uh, so the, the terms of service may, may, uh, need to make sense in, in that way with the, with, the, with the purpose of the company, with, with the way that it's structured and the, the, the objectives that it's trying to achieve. Uh, now, so the, the, for us, for example, as a, as, as a platform that we have a very specific mission, which is to empower everyone to, to use video to be able to, to fulfill their, 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 their own goals and their own objectives, and, and particularly people to, to be able to give high quality video to people to, to achieve their objectives, right? So our terms of service, are, and particularly our acceptable use policy, is conceived in a way to make sure that is that is possible and that our platform is used for the purposes that it's intended to be used and not for other purposes for which there may be other platforms, just not us, right? Um, so the type of things that you will see that is that we have the our acceptable use policy and the type of content we restrict is you will find most of these restrictions across the uh, platforms that that host video simply because it's kind of like best practice or at least common common uh, uh, um, uh, shared understanding of what type of content you would want and don't want to see in a platform that is so you know anything from uh, as i was mentioning uh harassment uh, uh, and abuse uh health related misinformation um uh, the violent content, uh, obviously anything that has to do with uh, content where children are explo exploited or, or, or abused. So it's very, it, it's the type of things that you would expect to see in a, in a platform uh, uh, that has kind of these uh, objectives. Uh, there's also other stuff that we, one of the things that we, that I'm, I'm, I'm rambling here a little bit, but one of the things that we do do as platforms is often react to the situation. So we may update our terms of service and our acceptable use policy based on dangers that we see coming up. So for example, with COVID, we had to, we had to issue new policies specific around uh, COVID misinformation because we wanted to protect our audience from that type of content that started proliferating in the, in the platform. So I'd say it's a very uh, live, uh, uh, the, the, the acceptable use policy is a very live document uh, uh, and very reflective of the issues that we're dealing with in the world. Yeah, such a good point that it's a living document that we continue to update as we confront things that we couldn't have imagined, like the COVID pandemic. Um, first and foremost, our goal on TikTok is to make sure that we're creating policies and terms of services that can be consistently enforced. 
and that we have equitable enforcement for all of the users that get to enjoy our platform. So a couple of the things that we've always held uh, close to mind as we were developing these policies were one, the Santa Clara principles on transparency is a framework that's been really useful to us. Um, we are a newer platform, so we're about three years old now or a little bit a little bit older than that, but we continue to make progress um, in putting those principles into practice. So ensuring user notifications and transparency for why their content comes down, the ability to appeal if they disagree with one of our decisions so that they can have more insights into what we expect our users to do or behave on our platform. Um, the other a key driver for our policies are making sure that we're engaging with the many resources that civil society provides to us. So um, we're able to leverage things like the ADL's list of hate groups and the National Eating Disorder Association's list of eating disorder terms and phrases, making sure that we're incorporating those experts into the way that we manage our platform because they can truly reach users and provide the expert resources that they might need to access and our partnering with them makes sure that uh, it's easy and quick to find an app for them. So the frameworks around the Santa Clara principles and transparency, but also just leveraging civil society for all of the great work that it's done. Can I just, that, that, that's a, a great point. And I just, to, to, to the mention you made about um, uh, ensuring that you can enforce your terms of service consistently and objectively. I think that's the goal for, for all, of all trust and safety teams, right? And all, 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 all in, in this sense, and it's that doesn't mean, which comes back to the point that we were mentioning earlier, that doesn't mean that your terms of service need to be the same as the next company. It means that you enforce your own terms of service that makes sense to your company in a way that is objective and consistent so that users have certainty as to what they can and cannot upload and what's allowed on your platform versus what's not. Um, which I think it's it's an important point. Yep. Yeah, thanks so much for bringing up that point, kind of really highlighting that as well. Like I have a couple of follow up questions to that, but just want to start off with uh, kind of kind of delving deeper into that point about how there are already you know established companies such as say Facebook, Twitter, who've um, you know their established terms and service terms of services and newer companies um, and very different products, you know, you're both video-based products. So we'd love to kind of hear from you, uh, from you both, how you're you know, kind of perceiving when making some of these decisions, kind of thinking about, obviously you have the fundamental principles of, to protect the users, but also shaping this, um, sorry, could you please mute? Uh, if you're not speaking, please be sure. Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, yeah, sorry, just going back to the, the question. Um, could you talk a little bit about how you think about designing some of these policies that is, you know, this living document, um, these living policies, uh, keeping the product in mind and how the product is being used and misused? Sure, I'll start that one off to give Erica a break. Um, so some of the things we think about as a living document of our community guidelines in general is again, just how are we seeing um, the use of our platform evolve and, and what do we really wanna make sure that's available to users? So one of the things is there's no one person at TikTok that's gonna make a unilateral decision about any one policy area. Instead, it's a lot of work with experts in consulting with them on what something like COVID and the ramifications of that are, how we've seen misinformation narratives spread throughout the internet and how we wanna be careful about those, especially in a video format. Um, so our team, or the policy team collaborates across our larger trust and safety team, which includes operations, um, backend strategy enforcement, and even our legal operations team to make sure we're working also with security to really develop those equitable policies and then ensure that we're enforcing them and hold ourselves accountable. Um, we also take a range of feedback in, whether that's from civil society or users themselves. So that's also a very important uh, signal to make sure we're, we're getting it right and being able to have the flexibility to go back and say, we tried to enforce that. We see that we're not doing it. We're not able to do it consistently or it's a little bit too nuanced. How do we calibrate and train our moderators? So one of the things I'm really proud of on our team is having um, a training team that reports directly into safety. And they're able to do trainings, not only on the technical parts of our policy, but also on things like unconscious bias or other aspects that we really wanna make sure 
the principle of the policy is being applied rather than the technical black and white. Because if you work in our world, you know that there's nothing black and white about UGC. It's all a shade of gray. Um, so those are the things we're trying to always keep in mind. Um, and the last thing I would just remind everyone of is like our biggest users are ourselves. Um, there's nothing that replaces going on your app and looking at how everything's evolving, looking at what your own for you page or other places look like on your app. Um, we're super users of our own app so that we can go in and, and really see what's happening in real time. That's a, a super comprehensive answer. So I, I don't have much to, to add except for the fact that Obviously, the, what we look into when we are, we, we do constant reviews to our terms of service, to our acceptable use policy. Uh, uh, and whenever we need to make an update, we make, we make the update. And what we're looking for is, is basically, we're, we're looking at how our platform is being used. We're looking, obviously, at how we want it to be used and if, there, if, if there's correspondence there. We're looking into, into what new challenges there are out there in the world. As I mentioned earlier, COVID being a perfect example. Um, we're looking at what policymakers are, are saying, what their needs and concerns and, and expectations from platforms are. Uh, we're, we're constantly checking in with our vendors that help us with, with some of the content moderation actions that are experts in specific areas of content. Um, uh, and we're, we're also looking, you know, to make sure that internally, from an internal perspective, we're make, working to make sure that the, 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 the perspective of the trust and safety team is uh, really uh, is included in the product development uh, process, which is, which is essential to, to, to minimize risk and to, and to put out their products and services that are going to be, to the extent possible, used the right way and minimize abuse of those products. Um, so yeah, I'll just add those to the list. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you both. It's um, so just to kind of summarize. You mentioned that there are a lot of a lot of stakeholders involved in both constructing some of these policies to then um, both the, you know, it's a, the iterative process of gathering feedback, and over time, um, a lot of new problems arising, a lot of new challenges that require additional um, changes to the policy itself. So, um, and a lot of different. Uh, stakeholders who are also holding you accountable from civil society organization to, the, uh, to governments to the users themselves um so would love to hear a bit from from you around kind of the user accountability or the accountability side of who are the these people who are keeping the platforms accountable um and um and what does your partnerships look like i know tara and erica you both mentioned touched on it a little bit uh but if you could elaborate on that as well Should I take this one first? To <laughs> uh, I think the 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 who's uh, keeping us accountable? Well, it's it's uh, there is both accountability to internally and and externally, obviously, right? Like we need to respond to our internal stakeholders. We need to make sure that we're meeting our our metrics that are we're meeting we're 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 doing our job, which is to to reduce the exposure of our users to harmful content and reduce the, the existence of harmful content or illegal content on our platform. From an outside perspective, obviously regulators and policymakers are always kind of like, it's, it's a, a real pressure in the sense that we know that if, you know, there's at the moment the whole debate about reform of section 230 in the United States, or you have the, the DSA in Europe and so many other proposals that are coming after those, uh, uh, to 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 pressure platforms to do a better job, and that's that's you know obviously it puts a spotlight on the fact that for many years we maybe weren't doing things uh, in the best possible way, uh, uh, and there's a better way going forward, and we need to kind of just keep improving and 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 uh, uh, iterating in our practices and, and and until we get it right or at least as as good as we can get it. Obviously, content moderation is extremely difficult because of what Tara mentioned uh, earlier, which is most of the you know the, the many the, the the black and white areas are very easy to deal with and you know if it's this it goes if it's this it stays but the problem is the massive chunk of gray content where you need to make a decision uh, uh based on obviously your your acceptable use policy but there's always an element of human decision involved which is very very challenging um and anyway, uh, so yeah, there's also obviously civil society. There's also like in our company, for example, in Vimeo, we have a very active, very, very present employee base who will call us out when we when when, when they see a particular type of content being, they go like, why, why are we not doing anything about this type of content? So that's a very, very strong uh, uh, 
stakeholder group uh, uh, that that we I'm sure you Tara have the same the same uh, issue. Uh, so yeah, where it's a, it's a the reality is that all of these processes and to be able to 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 get better at at moderating content and and keeping users and platforms safe, it needs to be a multi-stakeholder ongoing process where where everyone just uh, takes a part. Yeah, that's so well said. Um, I agree, of course, on the employee base and the civil society actors that we're able to partner with in holding us accountable. It's also forums like these where we're able to connect with our industry peers and understand um, what challenges they face and how we might come to solutions together as an industry is another really valuable mechanism that we have. One of the things I'd like to highlight um, on this piece is transparency is key. And so what are the messages that we're uh, or the communications that we're able to send out to be clear about how we're doing and where we see we are doing well and where we'd like to improve. So some of that happens in our quarterly transparency reports that we publish um, for all of our users to see and anyone else that would like. There's other opportunities that we have like these panels to tell you where we're facing challenges and where we're, we feel like we're doing a good job. And then the users themselves. Um, just as all of our employees are users, as are the users on our platform. And so we have uh, groups that are, that are designated as ERG or affinity groups that we always like to hear from. That feedback is really critical in making sure we're always improving our policies. And I'm near an airport, if you can't tell, so apologies about the plane flying overhead. <laughs> Yeah, no worries on that. Um, but yeah, thank you so much. And I can see that we already have a, a bunch of questions coming in where the people are excited to to speak to both of you directly. Um, but just kind of uh, just to follow up on on that, on how you, know, you kind of went over the, the process of decision making on um, also feedback loop that you have uh, ongoing, which is really amazing to see how many people um, are part of this whole process, um, who's keeping accountable, who's also providing uh, constantly, uh, I guess, chiming in into that process itself. Um, and just want to kind of hear from that, like going back to this feedback loop and users, because um, there are times where, you know, there are a lot of minority communities on the platform who are vulnerable communities who might not have that opportunity to provide that feedback at all times. I'd love to hear from both of you, what are some of those, um, you know, what are initiatives that you are taking in your respective companies to protect those communities? And just at large, what you think platforms should be doing more of to protect those vulnerable communities? Yeah, um, it's something that's always top of mind because it's not just about creating policy, but it's ensuring it's equity. And one of the things we've seen historically in different types of broadcast is how do we make sure that there's uh, voices from all center, all, all sort of perspectives and walks of life coming through. So it starts at the very basis of how we approach hiring. How do we ensure that everyone that's working on the policy team has a diversity of experience, both in terms of lived experience and the walks of life that they're coming from. So that's one of our key fundamental places that we start. Um, another part of that diversity is hearing directly from the users. And so I was really privileged to be able to speak with a group of uh, Canadian indigenous folks who have a huge presence on TikTok that you might not have realized. Um, indigenous people as a hashtag has over 4 billion views on TikTok. And so you just see the strong presence that they have and the way that they're keeping their traditions and cultures alive through the platform. And it's really our responsibility to ensure that we're elevating those voices and making sure that they're heard. Um, so again, respecting those conversations, ensuring that documentary footage or counter speech are being um, respected in terms of their va the value of their expression, and then also being sure that bad actors that would would seek to silence those voices aren't given that opportunity on our platform. Yeah, that 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 that's it's hard to add more much more to that because that is exactly what what needs to be done and what we're all I think most platforms that have a very very diverse user base and audience are trying to to achieve. Um, yeah, I guess an, another way that we that we have, uh, which uh, Tara mentioned earlier, is just making sure that we listen to what our users have to say to their 
to their feedback whenever we take if we take down a piece of content and they don't think you know we've made a right decision we give them the opportunity to to appeal and to and to tell us why they think we we, we made the wrong decision and if we start seeing that consistently and we realize there's a problem with how our policies are being understood or 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 uh, uh, applied either understood by the users or applied by our trust and safety team then we revise them to make sure that we that we change that and and uh, and make it clearer uh, and uh, yeah, and you know, a, a very specific uh, type of policy that we that we that we make a really in, we have we 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 really put a, a lot of importance in enforcing the right way is, is our, our our policy on on hate speech, and that has obviously the intention of of, of protecting uh, groups that uh, have traditionally been marginalized and making sure they have a, a way to express themselves and use our platform to 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 express themselves and. And as Tara said, just make sure that those who would use our platform to, to abuse those communities or to, to spread hate speech do not have the opportunity to do so. Yeah, and one just one last piece to add is none of this happens by um, coincidence. It's really intentional and important to create proactive programs around this. So a couple that we've done are the Creator Diversity Collective, which brings a it brings around a regular cadence of meetings with those of uh, different groups to come and tell us what their experience are like on platform. So we have a constant cadence of hearing from those users. Another is our Trailblazer programs, those that would be speaking out in and, um, and voicing about their community or sharing their tradition on the platform. We're looking to have to hear from them directly and also see how we can support them in the app. Um, so this will never be a success unless we're taking really intentional steps around it. And these are just a few of the programs that we're doing that with, um, as well as things like our hiring initiatives. Mm -hmm. Thanks so much for sharing that. That's, uh, that's wonderful to hear and um, like definitely makes me more optimistic about the future of trust and safety. Um, and yeah, would love to um, like kind of hear a little bit more around it. And I think that we did receive um, this question from one of the audience members as well as around the technology itself. Um, would love to hear from both of you around what are some of the technology in place, if you could speak to it um, briefly, and uh, especially for you, Tara, around um, just, you know, like TikTok is very machine learning driven, the For You page is, and TikTok's it just, its popularity itself is how um, like well curated and targeted the, the For You pages. So, um, you know, would love to hear how, if you can chat, like speak a bit about the, like how it's kind of amplifying some of the, the, the good content or, or I guess deep down ranking some of the harmful content as well. Yeah, of course, it's a great question. So we work hand in hand with AI and machine learning in addition to providing context that only humans can understand through their own evaluation. Um, our recommendation system is designed with safety in mind and we try not to recommend content that would be violative of our community get guidelines or would not be appropriate for a 13 plus audience for which the For You feed is designed for. Um, one of the other things that we are always keeping in mind is how can we empower our users to customize their own experience? And so some users are um, looking for communities of testimonial or lived experiences with challenges that they faced like eating disorders or other types of abuse. And we want to allow that content to live on the platform so that those seeking community there and relief can find that. But we realize that not everyone will be comfortable with it. So what are the tools we can give users who might not be comfortable with it to say, I'd rather not see this content or these types of words I'd rather block from my comment list because they're really challenging for me to see on a regular cadence. And so it's this combination of we know the worst of the worst things and we seek to take that down using all the tools available to us, including AI and machine learning and our human content reviewers. And then um, as things become more in that gray space that we've talked about, how do we ensure that users are empowered to customize their own experience on TikTok for whatever creativity and joy might mean to them? We are, I think we, we do the same. We have a, a, a team of, of human moderators and we complement that with, with uh, automated tools. We also work with amazing uh, third party vendors that as i mentioned earlier speci specialize on specific types of content and help us help us keep the platform uh, clean of of that content so that that is a, a a great resource to us 
And we are part of, uh, of a few different associations that have recently, well, recently, relatively speaking, uh, been created to, to help platforms like us and of all, of all sizes really um, uh, uh, keep harmful content uh, off their sites, like uh, Tech Against Terrorism, uh, 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 obviously, we work with when it comes to 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 child uh, sexual abuse material. We work with with Thorn, which is a great great, great resource to 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 making sure that this content is caught and then reported to NECMEC. Uh, so yeah, there's a, a a variety of different ways in which we we collaborate uh, both internally and with other uh, actors outside the company to to yeah to improve our content moderation practices. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks so much for answering those questions. I mean, I think there are a lot of times with, with a lot of the press around content moderation, it always mis makes it seem like, oh, TikTok has made this decision, Vimeo has made this decision. But I think the, the reality is always there are so many stakeholders constantly involved in making these decisions, keeping platforms accountable, providing that feedback, especially I think the efforts that companies are putting in, giving power back to the users and allowing them to provide feedback back to, to, to the companies to say that this is the type of content um, that we want to see, that we want shared. Um, and obviously at the same time and, and having governments is, um, and civil society constantly looped in through that process as well. Um, I know there are lots of questions uh, already in the chat. So I will just, um, just open up to question, audience questions a bit early and, um, I can start reading out the questions and then um, also if anyone wants to in the audience wants to you know speak and ask questions feel free to do so as well i'll just take the question that popped up in chat in the order as they appeared um so firstly someone thanks uh for us for the coordinating event and thank both of you for attending the the panel um and next, the question from Annabelle Flores um, is, how do you enforce or create policies while keeping in mind cultural diversity? I know um, you both kind of touched on this a little briefly, um, but anything you want to add to what you've already said? I think one quick piece to add to what we were speaking to before is not only leveraging the feedback that we have from users themselves and the proactive groups and programs we set up to highlight those voices, um, but also going through policy testing. We're really fortunate to be able to have sandbox experiments where we can look in and see how is the policy being really understood? Are there places we should either tweak the language of the policy itself, or we need to add more context in our trainings to moderators so that they understand what the spirit of the policy is really trying to control for and that there we do value the expression of all users and we want to make sure that we're um, holding that in the highest regard. So one of the things we've always spoken about is um, it might feel good to take content down because you feel like you're doing something to be protective, but actually in a lot of cases, the right decision is always to leave it up. And so making that trade off and understanding that not taking that action is just as important as taking it. And ultimately the spirit of the policy and the reason we're trying to enforce that policy is what you wanna hold in the back of your mind. Um, I think content moderators are our unsung heroes and I just wanna to continue to, to champion them and understand how we can ensure their mental health, um, provide them all of the resources to be successful and ensure that we're um, being clear in what we're asking of them and giving them strong rationales about why. Erica, would you like to add anything? To, to be honest, no, that was a great, great answer. Just uh, emphasize, I mean, there's many questions, so maybe we can go through the, through, the, through the other ones rather than me, just, yeah. Yeah, no worries. Yeah, I think that's, uh, I think that was just really, that was definitely really powerful to just think about how it, uh, it does, yeah, it feels really good that you're taking down the content, but also thinking more uh, critically around what, you know, when we should leave the content up as well. Um, and using that as a success metric as well. Um, thanks so much for that answer. Uh, cool, the next question is, uh, how do you go about getting and implementing user feedback? Erica, would you like to start? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, as I said, we, we have uh, obviously a contact uh, email address for our trust and safety team and for customer support. We have multiple ways of, of people 
writing in and giving feedback uh, and specifically more specifically when it comes to the enforcement of our terms of service and our acceptable use policy we always give the opportunity uh, for users to to appeal and to and to explain why either our our policies are not clear or why they're not um working well for the type of platform that we want to provide uh, and we always review those and if we see that this is a, 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 an issue that is that is you know repeating itself and it's coming up often then we review our policies as I said we have every month we review uh, 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 where we are and we make changes if we have to and then we have one very very big review yearly as well so it's a constant process of, of reviewing and updating based on user feedback and uh, also the feedback of our moderators, of course. Um, just to add in some like brick and mortar message or uh, mechanisms for feedback. Again, we have set up programs like the diversity task force and collective to ensure that we're hearing straight from our users about their experiences on the platform. Um, we also run focus groups to ensure that we're hearing about, you know, how are, how is your experience of using our customized tools working? Is there something that would be more intuitive to you than less? Because making sure everything is easy and accessible and intuitive is also just as important as having the mechanisms there. So it's, it covers a whole range of things, not just how our content mechanisms are working or our policies, but actually like how you access them and how you gain knowledge and insights and to um, what you're empowered to use the apps in a privacy settings for is another really important um, feedback loop that we really want to seek to improve and continue to be robust. Mm -hmm. um, cool, I see. Okay, the next question is about technology use. I know, again, this is something I kind of touched on a bit as well. Um, so I'll just move to the um, the next question um, about bad actors. Um, so bad actors operate across multiple platforms. Um, how are you collaborating with other platforms to address this challenge? Uh, this question is from Chloe Lee. Yeah, I think that there's there's a lot of uh, initiatives uh, that have you know formed in recent uh, months. Uh, precisely to do that, to make sure that industry is exchanging knowledge and that we're sharing uh, practices to, 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 to be able to combat these harmful actors who, by the way, are super creative and, and always come up with new ways to abuse uh, uh, services and systems. Uh, so there's there's a, there's a bunch of different uh, uh, groups like the, the Trust and Safety Professional Association. There's one group that's called the Digital Trust and Safety Leadership Council, which is basically comes together to... to the, the design a framework uh, uh, for, for content moderation, basically for, for to make sure that all of the companies can start following the same type of approach and, and strengthen their practices. There is groups, as I mentioned, like the, the Tech Against Terrorism, whose main objective is to help platforms combat terrorism. Um, there's a, a groups like uh, uh, NEGMEC, whose job is to, to, to make sure that companies have resources to combat uh, child sexual uh, abuse material online, uh, give CT again for terrorist content. So there's there's multiple different avenues. The UN has multiple resources as well, and 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 uh, so there's whenever you either want to 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 look into what other platforms are doing or read into government or policymakers recommendations, there's plenty of of resources out there. Of course, the work can still improve, and we can do a better job as industry in terms of exchanging this knowledge. and And we're getting there. It's just it's a relatively new thing, I would say. Uh, uh, but yeah, we're, we're definitely in the right path, I, I think. Yeah, as a former civil society member myself, I recognize the real value of multi-stakeholder initiatives, like all of the ones Erica just mentioned, as well as industry associations that we're able to join and learn from. So I think those are really fundamental, and I, I couldn't say more about the great programs that Erica had just mentioned. The other opportunities are just making sure that we're actually looking to see what is happening on other platforms. Um, the worst thing you can do is be narrow and siloed into only what's happening on yours. We exist in a larger ecosystem, and so need to continue to pay attention to what's happening on Telegram or other platforms um, to ensure that we're really meeting the needs of what could migrate over to ours and ensure that they don't make a footprint for those most malicious actors. So just um, adding that little bit to Erica's great overview of the really good organizations out there doing great work. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's, um, yeah, thank you both for, for sharing that. And I think it's also very interesting when you see those like users sort of migrating in or out of out of a product as a it's also a metric of how people are perceiving some of the the terms of services and the, the policies um, but at the same time being critical about okay well, how much of that is just an aspect of the policy of the the product itself and how you kind of again go back to the principles of content moderation and and how that ties to your uh, respective product and mission um, the next question that we have is for you tara about what are content moderators at TikTok? Where are content moderators at TikTok based? Are they distributed worldwide? Sure, yeah. So we have content moderators in the United States. We have full-time content moderators. We have part-time content moderators. Um, again, it's one of those things, there's no silver bullet for any of this or one template. If you think about TikTok, we have so many policies that uh, touch different surfaces. So it's not only about video, it's also about text and user profile images. We have live stream available now. And so we're really looking to make sure we're leveraging the content moderators that have experience in this industry and also have the experience of different lived um, experiences and diversity in their own background. So um, the I oversee the US policy and um, trust and safety team with my colleague, Eric Hahn, and we're always really focused on what is the right thing for the American market and the way that we wanna ensure our users in the US are being, um, are given fair and equitable treatment. And so it's ensuring that there's cultural diversity, ensuring that those that have really talent and experience in things like live stream or others are also part of the program. So. It's an, another place where casting a wide net and ensuring you're getting the best of the best um, in a range of different uh, experiences and skills is really important as our uh, platform and product the products that we offer continue to evolve. Yeah, I think um, that kind of that's a good segue to the next question as well, which is about how um, about bias in the content moderation process. Um, if you could both kind of touch on how do you how you address bias, I think, again, like a little bit that you mentioned is around, you know, hiring and focusing on diversity and equity and hiring process as well as, um, uh, but would also love to hear with, you know, some of these companies, for example, you being based in, in the US, and Erica, you're, you're in London, kind of like how you ensure that the entire process is, um, that the policies themselves are not kind of coming from from the from just one perspective, but have that uh, multi-dimensionality to it too. Yeah, so obviously when 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 we draft these policies, you try to have as global and as an approach as possible because you know your user base is, is global, right? Uh, I think one of the 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 key points is, and I think Tara mentioned this earlier, is is training, internal training, uh, to make sure that your content moderators really understand the spirit behind the policy. There's always a, obviously a rationale as to why you're implementing a certain a certain policy and training is essential because in the end, they're going to be the ones in many instances that have to make this decision. So the making sure they get the nuance and they make the, and, and, and they get what, just a, the really un, a really good understanding of why, what the principle or what the objective of the specific policy is, is essential. And, and that needs to be an iterative process and it needs to you know, happen every so often to make sure that everyone is kind of like uh, uh, on top form when it comes to that. And because inevitably what happens is that you start applying your own personal you know, views on, on, on the world into your moderation decisions. So you need to have those policies and the spirit behind those policies very fresh in your mind when you're looking at content. And really the reality Reality, coming back to what Tara said before about sometimes the right decision is to leave content up. Sometimes we see a piece of content that is not necessarily something we like because we, you know, we come from a different politics camp or whatever. But then, you know, if you really understand the objective of the policy, then you need to leave it up because there's other values that we're trying to protect, including, you know, defending the right of a group to express themselves, even if it's not a very popular opinion, as long as it's not, you know, hate speech or abuse, they have a right to express that as well. Uh, you know, so it's it's a very difficult situation, but I think training and, and polishing of the policies is key. Um, yeah. Yeah, I couldn't say that better myself. I agree with that for sure. 
another. Great. Um, cool. The next question is uh, about, oh, sorry. Yeah. How do you collaborate with government leaders and nonprofits in creating policies? How do you identify the stakeholders to bring into the conversation? Um, this is also from Annabelle. Also, um, just want to touch kind of a quick plug. Uh, we do have other, we do have an event coming up. Uh, actually, two different panels, one focusing on government and the role of government on content moderation on September 22nd, and one focusing on civil society, uh, the role of civil society around content moderation coming up on September 15th, uh, where we will be going deeper into this and we'll have people from civil society and government organizations uh, talking about this. But uh, passing it back to Tara and Erica to touch on, uh, answer this question. I think there's lots of great examples of the ways governments are seeking to um, solve a lot of the same problems that we are and how we can best partner with them. So uh, Canada just introduced a hate crimes bill that they're socializing around how they might seek to regulate that and have a great consultative period with companies like ourselves to understand how that would work in practice, what we're already doing in the space and where they can leverage um, their share of the civil society sector to help out with the with our ultimate goal of achieving a safe online platform. The same holds true in Europe and in um, the US and of course in Australia and other regions where the government really is looking to say we have a shared objective here, how can we pull, pull um, complementary levers to ensure that we're meeting that objective. And those consultations are really helpful because we have again complementary skills that we're able to leverage. Um, we also are really fortunate that we have such a robust civil society sector that's able to do the research that they have done and spent so much time on really digging down on difficult issues like the evolution of hate speech and how we can be on top of that as it's something that continues to evolve. Um, so it's both of those things that are really important and I see more often than not we have shared objectives and we are able to Get, share experiences, but also how we can leverage each each other's own skills um, and power, really, to see what what that looks like uh, for our, our user base to keep them safe. Yeah, I, I completely agree with that. I think governments are doing a much a, a great great job in terms of reaching out to platforms and making them part of the of the of their consultation uh, work, uh, particularly when it comes uh, obviously to medium and smaller size companies who have maybe traditionally not been part of these processes. I think that's a very, very important and good development because the voices of the of these companies need to be heard. It's not only about, you know, far four or five dominant platforms. It any change in terms of law and policy impacts the wider ecosystem. So so it's uh, it, it's fundamental. I think another another way in which we uh, uh, typically uh, get in touch with policymakers or regulators or ensure that we're part of these processes is through trade associations and now more and more smaller types of coalitions between like-minded companies that that you know want to to be able to take a seat at the table and express their views on these issues they are becoming super important and as i mentioned earlier and, and to the question that came up before about the different groups that are being formed to 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 not only share best practice but also um, act as, as as sort of common fronts uh, uh, for many different companies to 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 reach policymakers and regulators and make sure that that the message is delivered in a way that is productive and that we're able to to to, to be part of these debates in a way that is constructive and actually leads to good policy outcomes uh, for everyone. Awesome. Thank you. Um, cool. I will pass to uh, Ruchika. Wanted to ask a question, so just. Ruchka, are you still there? Okay. Yes. Hi. Uh, so I'd like to ask two questions. First, um, how would you handle a conflict uh, if there's a conflict between, let's say, uh, the policy team and the product team? Uh, uh, let's say, like, if the product says that uh, we need to implement this feature, it's good for business, it will help us driving sales. But then the trust and safety team thinks that, uh, okay, this is not aligned uh, you know, with the safety policy. So how would you handle such sort of conflicts? And uh, my second question would be, uh, how do you how do you deal with a different region? Basically, um, to give you an example, gambling is allowed in a few countries and it's banned in other countries. Mm -hmm. So do you have a, a global policy which is uh, sort of uh, implied and how would you deal with such kind of content? Would you keep it or would you sort of like remove it? 
Yeah, thanks. Those are two really great questions. Um, I'll take the second one first in that we have a set of global policies and the rationales that we have all aligned to our the safety and our objective as a trust and safety team to keep users safe. But how we localize those policies, for example, in the US hate speech looks very different than it would in some parts of Asia or Europe. And we need to ensure that we're giving moderators the right signals to be looking for, especially in our region. So we do lean local and localize those policies as they make sense in region. Um, to your first question around um, conflicts between different teams, such as product and trust and safety, it's usually more of a yes and dance than it is an either or dance. And so there's a lot of um, work to be done to see, okay, we're going to go for this product that has its own trust and safety challenges, but what are the strategies that we can use or the range of evaluation that we can do to ensure that we minimize safety risk? And so it's it's not usually dismissing a, a feature altogether. Instead, it's just contextualizing where it could be abused or where we've seen similar products go wrong and how we can put those safeguards in place. Um, and product is usually happy to do that to see their product succeed. I would completely agree with that. I think that the role of the trust and safety team is not to be a blocker in, in terms of product development or feature development, but rather to, to be able to, to, to spot risks and just say like, look, this particular feature, this particular thing represents, could be potentially risking this. What can we do to minimize that risk? What can we do to, 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 to make sure that we obviously do not expose our users to, 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 to whatever harms um, so yeah, I think I think that's that's definitely it's it's always you need to have a, a process where where you have almost like, like you have a checklist where you look for things where you have conversations with the product team that is developing this this feature or or a specific uh, uh, product and it just it's 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 an ongoing process it never stops obviously in a company that is co constantly evolving and developing new things it's just all the time you have these dialogues and then. Um, yeah, I, I think I think that's that's uh, that's pretty much it. I can't remember what was the second question. The uh, the second question the was around uh, the localization of the policy. Oh like right, to yeah, well, it's the same approach. To be honest, it's a global policy that we apply uh, uh, consistently, 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 and objectively. And when it comes to specific nuances of specific places, we try to make the decision that is right for that as long as it's obviously in line with the main overall policy. But yeah, it's uh, it's very difficult in a, in a world like ours to, yeah. Yeah, I think just to kind of follow up to that, first of all, thanks Ruchika for asking those great questions. But uh, our next question is from Mary, which is kind of like a follow up to the question about localization of policies, but kind of from the other end, which is, how do we tackle when some of our policies are, you know, incongruent to local laws, which are more repressive, more, um, you know, against that kind of suppress free speech in those countries? Um, how do you tackle those um, that conflict between your global policy um, and protect, you know, and, and local policies which are suppressing freedom of expression? The majority of my job is really to ensure that our U.S. users. Are, uh, have policies to, and standards to meet that meet the cultural expectations of the US market. And so I'm fortunate that I haven't had to have those conversations in my experience, but realize that they're challenging ones to have. I think what's overriding all of those conversations is we, had a, we have a set of values around um, expression and creativity and also ensuring safety, whether physical or psychological, that we always adhere to. And those are conversations that are ongoing with governments the same way there's ongoing conversations with different civil society members um, that want to ensure that their constituency group is being protected in the best way possible. And so we continue to have those conversations, but first and foremost, we're putting our values and our principles there to say, these are the reasons that we take this approach. Can you share more? Um, but really doing the communication and explaining why we are set up the way we are and why we think it has merit. Yeah, I, I guess just to add to that, the only, we, we the aim is the same, but the, the only cases where we where, where it's sometimes sometimes difficult is when you would get like a proper court order from a country that is demanding that you take down a specific type of content. And the way we approach it to be able that we protect as much as possible 
the user's right to express themselves is just blocking content for that specific country, but not for the rest of the world necessarily, if it's not illegal content for the rest of the world. So that, that type of measure is something that you can do when, when a particular country in its law says you cannot have this content. And we, while we may disagree, it's actual a legal requirement. So we, we're kind of, it's a, it's a difficult situation to deal with for sure. And uh, yeah. Yeah, thank you so much for answering all those questions. I know we had a really great conversation going and more questions incoming. Just want to leave that someone mentioned that they're uh, wowed by the learning a lot about from this meeting. So that's a great note to close on. And I know there are a couple other questions. Just want to highlight we will be sharing um, next week. Uh, we will be sharing or like sending out a um, a. a I guess, a uh, pamphlet with uh, different resources on trust and safety, uh, content moderation, starting from um, resources on every, you know, things that you need to know about, different, you know, partnerships, um, different initiatives that uh, all these, um, th that industry has been taking, government laws, uh, as well as how you can kind of break into trust and safety and, how, and growth in the trust and safety space. Um, but for today, uh, we're at time, so we will be closing uh, now. Thank you so much to both Erica and Tara for joining us and uh, sharing uh, and answering all our, all our questions. And thank you to all uh, the attendees for attending. Uh, watch out for our other events if you're interested in finding out more about content moderation at large. Um, the upcoming, the next event coming up is on September 15, um, focusing on uh, civil society and September 22nd on the role of government. And then we will be having, fingers crossed, we will be having local happy hours in the Bay Area as well as in uh, Washington, D.C. So if you're located in any of those um, nearby and able to attend, uh, please watch out for uh, info on that as well. And uh, if not, thank you so much for joining. Um, stay tuned for all our upcoming events. And uh, thank you to thank you again, Tara and Erica. Thanks to everyone. Have a great day. Thanks, Bye, everyone.